I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He was that light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. We are the chosen generation. God has chosen you to be his people. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. And so God has chosen you to be the instruments through which he will reveal to the world the glories, the blessings. God who has called you out of darkness and into his glorious light has called you to be his witnesses to the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Amen. A pastor, a priest, and a rabbi are on a little trail walk, and they come across a big old suitcase full of cash. The pastor says, I know what we should do with that. We should draw a little circle in the dirt, throw up the money, whatever lands in the circle we can keep, and the rest goes to God. The priest says, no, no, you got it wrong. Let's throw up the money, whatever lands in the circle is God's, the rest we can keep. The rabbi says, no, 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 you both have it wrong. Throw up the money, and whatever God catches, he keeps. <laughs> the rest we keep. Huh? <laughs> Some of you, that's your tithing philosophy. And we need to talk about that. Right? That's, okay, we need to talk about that. But no, as a matter of fact, we're very excited that that's not the way Skyline is, and I'm going to share with you in a moment. But first, let's welcome in our church family in Lakeside. Thank you, Lakeside Church family, for joining us. And I wanted to let you know, in two weeks, March 5th, I'm going to be speaking live in person in Lakeside, and we're going to broadcast it to our other campuses from Lakeside on March 5th. I can't wait to see you all over there. That's going to be fun. And then Tennessee. Hello, everybody in Tennessee watching us in Tennessee gathered there. Appreciate you guys tuning in as well. And of course, Kansas City, home of the Super Bowl champions. Come on. I told you. Okay, and uh, that's exciting. Everybody watching online as well, our online church family. And guys, this is so exciting. I told you I'd give you where we're at with 101010. And I want to show you on the screen, I'm going to show you our totals. So let me explain it before you cheer, because you're going to cheer. It's going to be exciting. Take a look at this. Take a look at this stat. Okay, in 2022, we started this over a year ago, we had 8.1 million pledged. In 2023, when I, we just finished that 101010 series, we had 433,000 plus, because we still have some coming in from other campuses, but over 433 new pledges. And then, some of you did not write down your commitment, but you said, I'm going to give anyways. I, I didn't write it down. I don't know, maybe you're low faith, you don't know if something's going to happen, but you gave anyway, so I'm so grateful that you did that. Over 1.6 million has come in from people that did not say they're giving, they're going to make a commitment, but they made a commitment without saying it, and they gave to 101010. 10, 10. Our total received so far is 6.5, but our total campaign, 10.1 million! <laughs> Way to go, church. Generous, generous church, and so far, 6.5 has come in, so you see that on the chart there, that uh, 3.5 still, or 3.6 still to come in, and we're going to continue again as I welcome in these campuses, and we continue to see God doing incredible things, over 1,580 people that accepted Christ last year, and we're going to see more and more of that. And by the way, 52 baptisms last Sunday. Way to go, church. 52. So fired up, fired up, fired up, and uh, so appreciative. And so when you see those numbers, don't be like, okay, I guess we're done. No, we're just getting started. As we said in the beginning of that campaign is that seed money to be able to do what you've seen so far, and uh, we're going to continue to see God do incredible things. We're going to receive communion at the end of the message. I just want to prepare your hearts for that, and uh, if you don't have a communion cup, we'll get those to you by the end of the uh, service. Now... Our survey, we started uh, collecting these surveys last week. 
But I want you to, uh, we're going to do this for the next couple weeks because not everybody is here every week and all that stuff. So what I want you to do is scan the QR code so that it's easier to do it digitally on the app. That'll download the app and it's so easy. Click, 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 click. We want to take a couple minutes and do this. This helps us so much determining some of the next steps of our church family and what we want to do. So you'll notice the survey in your notes, but as I said, digitally would be better. We want to know how you first came to Skyline. Was it through one of these events? And if it was one of the events, please mark it. When you first came, or was it the the Skyline Christian Academy? Was it just a a Sunday service? Whatever it might be. And then with number two, what we're asking you to do is, was that an invite from someone? If it was, please mark who that was. A family, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, you know, Uh, One of those, or if it was someone else, just mark that or something else. And then the third one is maybe it's not uh, one or two, but it's third. You came because of marketing or advertising. You drove by the campus, uh, one of our campuses. You started watching online. It may have been COVID that brought you. Whatever it was, we just want to know that. That'll help us tremendously. And then you'll notice on the next one, we want to know where you're coming from. How long of a drive to one of our campuses How long of a drive is it for you so that we can understand maybe where we want to go next with our campuses, how far away you are, and if you'd put like even where you're coming from, that would help us a lot. And then what service, aside from our Sunday at 9 and 11, would you be most likely to invite your Oikos to? We're looking at adding a third service, as I mentioned, but we want to make sure we don't just throw a dart in in the air and hope. We want to know... What one is, is really the best time? Because we, we realize some people work on the weekends. So you invite your oikos, and they're like, no, I work on Sundays. Um, and so we can tell them to watch online, but they're missing out on the fellowship part of it and all that. So we want to know, what could be a good time? Friday? Uh, is it Wednesday? Is it a Sunday night? Is it a Saturday night? Is it, you, know, you see the different options there, but more than that, write one in if the option isn't there. We just kind of seeded it with some of those things. And then the favorite thing about Skyline, what I'm really looking for there is what is your favorite event at Skyline? What's your favorite event that we're, we're really looking for? What's your favorite thing about it there? Take a couple minutes and just do that. And uh, man, we'd appreciate that. Again, this really drives some of our decisions moving forward as we try to seek the Lord what he wants and then what's, what's expedient for our people. As you're doing that, uh, last week, we began, and then, by the way, our ushers will, will receive those. You can even um, move those to the ends of the row when you're done. Our ushers will receive them. If you're still working on it um, and you're thinking about it, you can drop it in the offering box when you leave. That would help. But our ushers will go ahead and collect those. Just move those to the end of the row. Appreciate you guys doing that so much. Um, last week, as I mentioned, we began a new teaching series on our Word of the Year and I explained how we get come to that word of the year. If you missed it, you're going to lose a thousand square feet of your mansion in heaven. But that's, some, that's a whole other thing. You can get that mansion back by watching it online. I want to make sure you understand the foundation for where we're headed and what we're doing and how we're moving forward. Uh, but our word of the year is light. That's light. That's our word of the year. And it's, uh, we want to shine our light in our culture, no matter how dark our culture might get. We want to shine that light. And the title for today's message is For the Love of Lent. For the Love of Lent. And we're going to be taking a look at what does it mean? What does Lent actually mean? And how do we go about that in the Christian tradition? Isn't that an old tradition? Yeah, but at the same time, it's something that uh, is a tremendous practice if we'll do it appropriately. And I'm going to read our main section of scripture, and it's going to come up on screen as well. But If you wouldn't mind, if you're able, would you stand for the reading of the Word of God? And he was teaching about salt and light, and it's an interesting thing when you think about salt, right? Salt is this idea of, uh, when you have salt, it causes you to be thirsty, doesn't it? And when you think about what a Christian is supposed to do and be, uh, we are supposed to shine our light so brightly in such a loving and graceful and incredible way that people thirst for Christ. Not, they don't thirst for us, but they thirst for Christ. And I love that illustration 
of salt and light. So in verse 14, he says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. The reading of the Word of God. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your Word. Thank you for what you're doing in your church. Thank you that we get to be a part of it. Thank you for using us. And Lord, today we just pray as we open up your word and think about this idea of Lent and what it means in our lives. Tell us, Lord, tell us what you want us to do individually to really draw closer to you. What is it going to take for us? We thank you for that. We trust you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name. Anybody said? Amen. Amen. Okay, so as we look at this, love for the love of Lent, this is the Lenten season where when you think about Lent, it's a very practical way to show our love for the Lord. It's a practical way. Lent begins on Wednesday of this week, Ash Wednesday it's known as, February 22nd, and it's 40 days from that point leading up to Easter. Now, different Traditions do it different ways. What we're doing is we're taking those 40 days. It's actually 46 days leading up to Holy Saturday. That's the Saturday before Easter. And we're going to take those 46 days because six of those are Sundays. And we don't focus on it on Sunday. But 40 days throughout the week, and we're going to look at how do we practice Lent. And it leads to... The ultimate, remembering the ultimate sacrifice. As we give our sacrifice, it leads to that ultimate sacrifice that we remember that Jesus sacrificed for us. So I want to talk for a moment about why we're talking about this, why we're doing this, because this practice is so easily forgotten in our comfort driven culture. And we're going to see how it could draw us so much closer to the Lord. Because, listen, God is always more interested in growing your character than he is your comfort. We're naturally drawn to comfort. As human beings, we're always looking for ways to make ourselves more comfortable. Sleep number beds. I mean, that's one great example, right? We're always, it's got to be perfect. Let me get the number. And it's like, that's who we are. That's what, but oftentimes that can prevent a growing relationship with Christ because whenever we're uncomfortable, we think we're outside of God's will or something. All of a sudden we're going, what's going on? What's going on? It's like, no, no, no. I'm here to grow your character. So one of the practices that is known as Lent, well, what does it mean? I should say first. Lent is just a very old English word that actually, Lenten, it means springtime. (laughs) And some translations mean even long or lengthen. And we can see that in the word Lenten, lengthen. And if you are sacrificing something for 40 days, it's long. It feels very, very long. And so I want us to see how fasting even plays a significant role in our spiritual development and in our discipline as Christians. The purpose of Lent, though, is preparation for the believer towards Easter, as I mentioned. And here are some of the practices within that. There's obviously prayer. Traditionally, there's something called mortifying the flesh. I love how the old school way it says it, mortifying the flesh. It's just denying yourself, right? It's denying the flesh. Uh, There's things like repentance, of course, repenting of sins. There's offerings to be given. It's known as almsgiving. There's a, a simple living during that time. There's Fasting, we'll talk about. There's giving up of certain luxuries in imitation of Jesus. In his 40 days and 40 nights in the desert when he fasted and he was tempted by the enemy. And so we do that and it's known as the Lenten sacrifice. Now, I'm not even going to talk about the physical benefits of fasting and of this season. But it's incredible. I'm just going to be focused on the spiritual benefits. But it is incredible. There's enough scientific studies out there. You can just go look at it. Of the benefits of fasting. 
and even intermittent fasting. It's incredible benefits. It's almost like God knew what he was doing, you know? It's one of those things. It's incredible. What a God. So, all right, so let's jump into this. Talk about Lent and why we should take note of it and why we should practice it. Lent is, number one, Lent is all about creating space for God. It's a time where in our culture, we are so driven through busyness, through distractions, through media, through everything else that our lives continually and naturally push God out. That's just what happens in our life. We're constantly pushing God away, even unintentionally. That's just what happens in our life. And Lent is a season where we go, you know what? I've gotten away from some of the foundational things that I need to do to be growing in my faith. And what happens when that happens? Well, you feel dry spiritually. You feel distant from God. You don't feel God's blessing on your life. You just start to feel this, ugh. And what's happened? Well, our culture has been driving you away from God. And if we're not intentional, then what ends up happening is we've drifted away from God. Just like in the ocean, we talk about a lot, right? It doesn't take anything to drift away from where you got in the ocean. You just go with the current. If we just go with the current of our culture, it naturally takes us away from God. So we have to take some time, like in the Lenten season, and go, hey, you know what? I'm going to take specific time, and I'm going to create space for God to move and work specifically in my life so I can even hear from God. Why? Well, look what it says in James. James 4, 8, the brother of Jesus. He says, come close to God, and God will, read it with me, come close to you. God hasn't moved. It's us, right? We're the ones that get in trouble because we continually move, 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 go, 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 go. And Lenten season is a great reminder to just bring us back to focus. And as we move towards God, he comes close to you. <laughs> you go, oh, well, he's moving too. No, it's because we're going closer to him. He's naturally, it's happening. We're getting closer to God. He's waiting. He has the answers. He has the time. And the question is, will we create that space to receive his answers, to receive his comfort, and to receive his will? So that's the first thing. Number two, would you write this down? Lent is about sacrifice. It's a season of service, of generosity, of giving something up for the Lord. It's a time where we decide to give something up so we can focus on him more. We have to take an honest look at our lives, and we're going to do that during communion today. You take an honest look and evaluate your life of where you're at in your relationship with the Lord. Some of you, you're going to say yes to the Lord today for the first time, and that's awesome. You you can honestly say, I don't have a relationship with the Lord, and that's Today's going to start that relationship. But we need to ask God during that time, what is keeping me from a closer relationship with you, God? What is it that is in front of me? Sometimes we don't realize what's distracting us. Sometimes it's just life is busy. And we have to have space within our church service, within our life, to be able to say, God, what is it? And and I'm telling you, when your heart is quiet, and you're ready to hear from God, he speaks. And it's like, oh, okay. Then it's a matter of are you willing? (laughs) Are you willing to give that thing up so that your relationship with God can really thrive? So what would you have me sacrifice? For some people, it's certain food. It might be a beverage. It it, it might be TV. It, It might be, you know, you can go on and on. It could be something very basic. It may be social media. It might be, you know, I don't serve, and I'm just gonna take this season And I'm going to jump into serving the Lord in this area of ministry and just see. Just see if that doesn't draw me even closer to the Lord. So it's about sacrifice. Sacrifice. But thirdly, Lent is not to be legalistic. Very important we understand this because we start talking about Lent and it can easily go into a works-based religion. We start going, ah, here it is. Works-based stuff. I got to do, do, do in order for the Lord to love me. No, no, no. It's not to be legalistic. Look what it says here in Matthew 9, 13. You've got to understand the um, context here. Okay, Jesus is getting reprimanded by the religious leaders of the day before he, Jesus says this, okay? The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because why? Because he invited Levi, known as Matthew, 
to have dinner with them. And basically, let's get together. Let's all get together. Matthew, you bring your oikos, your friends, bring them all together. And the Pharisees look at Jesus and go, why are you eating with such scum? They literally said, you're a religious guy. Why are you hanging out with people like that? Sinners, you know, thieves, all this stuff. And he tells them, it's not the healthy that need a doctor. It's the sick. That's why I've come, to seek and save the lost. And then he tells them, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. That's why we say no perfect people allowed. You can't even come here. You shouldn't even come if you think you got it all figured out, you got it all together. Because there's a bunch of imperfect people here. And we say that a lot to keep it in front of you. And where does that scripture come from? When he said that, go and learn what this scripture means, he's talking about Hosea 6.6 in the Old Testament. When God said... I desire mercy, not sacrifices. And so we want to make sure this isn't something out of legalism. We want to make sure this is a heart thing because God, he says, I don't look at what man looks at, which is the outside. He says, I want your heart. I'm always looking at the heart. So these practices are to transform our heart. It's to draw us closer to him. Not so on the outside we look like we're more righteous or we're better than somebody else. That's legalism. So it's not to be done with hated anticipation. Oh, he's calling us too fast. Man, hate that stuff. Well, then don't do it. (laughs) It's not meant for you. Like, if you you can't come to it with that kind of a a mindset, you know, I've got to give something up. Man, like, that's not going to work at all. God really wants your heart. And and what you're going to see during the time of Lent is a transformation. If you go all in for it, and you're going to see God move and work and speak to you in ways that he's never done before. Because you're creating that space to allow it to happen. And again, you're not obligated to do it. Listen to me. You could be a Christian and go to heaven and never participate in the Lenten season. Okay? Okay? Now, it wouldn't be the best Christian experience of life to not do these things, to not have a time of sacrifice, but you'll still go to heaven. I mean, you might not have a mansion, you'll have a little shack, you know, <laughs> in, the, in the Oakland part of, uh, <laughs> of heaven, right? But, you know, that's, that's your choice, but... Uh, You don't have to do this. You're not obligated because, as we say all the time, willingness beats obligation. That comes to your giving, comes to your serving, that comes to your attending. Willingness beats obligation. You have to have a willing heart to do it because at the end of the day, it's about moving your heart towards the Lord and what he wants for you and how he wants to use you in this life. And so it always starts with a humble attitude. It starts with, Lord, I want to come before you. And I want to learn. I want to hear from you. I'm creating this space. I'm so grateful for you. And it goes from there. Only then will the blessings that he promises truly begin to flow into your life. So as we decide we're going to do this for 40 days, we should understand what fasting is. So Lenten and sacrifice and fasting all go together. But what is fasting? Let's take a look at that. One, fasting is a spiritual discipline. You must understand This is part of the Christian experience. At least it's supposed to be. Not everybody practices it, but it's a tremendous spiritual discipline. Fasting. You cannot spell the word discipline without disciple. And if you're going to be a disciple, there has to be an element of discipline. Has to be. You're going to get the most out of the Christian life, the most out of your gifting, the most out of what God wants for you when you have a disciplined life. And never forget this statement. Discipline equals freedom. Discipline equals freedom. You can look at that in your physical life. The more discipline you have physically, the more freedom you have. As you get older, everybody gets older. As you get older, the more you continue to do your exercises and stretch and walk or run or do some weightlifting and all that stuff and your discipline in your diet and what you put into your body and all those things, the more freedom you have as you continue to get older. The less you do those things, the more you actually become in bondage, bondage to pain, 
and in bondage to inflammation and in bondage to injuries and in bondage, I can go on and on, right? The more discipline you have, and no, it's not easy to get up and to do the work, to continue to, to work on the body, but the more freedom you have, the more disciplined you are. Spiritually, it's the same thing. The more that we're disciplined spiritually, the more freedom we have. And you know what? The more God uses us as we decide, I'm going to practice these things. I'm going to do these things. I I want more of you, Lord, and I want to be used more by you in this life. And so I'm going to be disciplined in these things. And I want to see how you're going to come through. Fasting is also number two, to seek guidance from God. When I fast, there's clarity means I want to find out what direction should I take. A lot of people fast when there's big decisions in life, and that's a good thing. i got some big decisions, Lord. I don't want to focus on food, or I'm not going to focus on TV, or I'm not going to listen to social media or watch social media. I'm going to, just, I'm going to fast those things so I can, I can hear from you. I'm going to fast by getting up earlier than I would normally so I can just hear from you because I need your guidance. This is a big deal. And when we fast, it just allows us to hear more clearly from the Lord. There's a focus that happens because it puts our thoughts in one direction. The distractions are limited. And now all of a sudden, it's like my ears are starting to open up to what God wants to say because I'm actually taking time to to hear. I'm seeking God. And here's the other thing is when I do that and the answer comes, it may not even be the answer that I wanted. (laughs) Or the answer that I hoped for. But peace comes over me. And I'm able to go, okay. Your will be done, not mine. I got the answer. Got it. Good. Moving forward. Thank you, Lord. Jeremiah 29, 13. Notice what it says here. Jeremiah 20 says, you will seek me. And what? Okay, so so many people. I never know. I can't hear from the God. I don't know where's God. I don't hear from God. Why don't I hear from God? You will seek me and find me when... You seek me with, what? With, okay, so with all, but most of us think, well, you know, if I throw a prayer up there, no, he says, with all your heart, right? With all your heart. He says, if, when you really go for it, when you really decide, I'm all in, Lord, I'm all in on this Christian thing, man, I'm going for it, then you start to see him, <laughs> You start to hear him more and more and more. And we can go over testimony after testimony where people say, absolutely, it wasn't until I fully, fully said, I'm in. Whatever the consequences, Lord, I'm in. I'm doing this. I'm walking with you. That's when it all changes. That's when it all changes. The other thing fasting is to do is to repent. We need to repent during our fast. We need to repent of the habits and distractions of the... These different things that allow us to have space. When we, when we decide, I'm repenting of those things, God, and we just say, okay. Okay, I'm pushing those things aside so that I can create this space. Listen, when we repent, if we don't repent, and we just keep on keeping on with our life, and we haven't repented, there, there is a block. There's like a lid on our prayers. You have to see it that way. Okay, it's not like we're holding a secret from God. He knows, he sees everything. He knows what we've done. We just need to go to him. We just need to go to him. Look at this verse. This is such a great reminder. It says then. Now, he's obviously, at this point, to give you context, he's talking to the children of Israel, but the application is relevant for all believers. It says, then if my people, who are called by my name, this is so key, will humble themselves. It's humbling to come before God and say, I blew it. I was foolish. I was wrong. It's humbling. It's humbling. If they will humble themselves, but most people only humble themselves to do that, and pray and seek my face, and here's a big word, turn. Turn from their wicked ways. Now understand, that word literally is a 180. In the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that word is metanoia. And it doesn't just mean, hey, I have an idea that I should not do that. It literally means I have to have a change of mind and action. I'm not doing that anymore. That's true repentance. That's metanoia. That's a 180. 
180 degrees that says, I was doing this, God, I am sorry I'm not doing that anymore. And I go in the complete opposite direction. That's true repentance. And that's what we have to come to the Lord with and say, Lord, I, I'm sorry. And look what it says he'll do. He'll forgive their sins and restore their land. Does this land need res- restoration? You better believe it does. We've got to humble ourselves. And then fasting is, number four, it's both personal and corporate. It's both personal and corporate. This is so important to understand. I'm calling you as a church to a personal fast that will have corporate implications. Now, what does that mean? I'm calling you to this fast. If we were doing a corporate fast, we would all be fasting the same thing. But we're not. And we'll talk about different things that you can fast. But we're corporately doing it personally. Way to go. Way to confuse them, preacher. But that's the idea. We're, we're all doing a fast, but we're going to do individual things that God speaks to each of our hearts. And so there'll be a time when we call a corporate fast. There will be where we say, hey, let's all not do this. Let's all like stop eating for whatever days or stop drinking or whatever it might be. Okay, so that's the difference. Now, fasting number five, you've got to understand this. It is not for show. Not for show, folks. This is so important. I'll never forget early on, and I was a new Christian, but I knew this was wrong when someone was looking all weird and, and, and they were kind of walking around and just tired and they were just, and I was like, hey man, what's going on? What's going on with you? And I was a young pastor and, uh, and they said, well, I'm fasting. <laughs> and even as a young, <laughs> pretty ignorant pastor, I knew that wasn't the way to do it. Like that was wrong. And scripture is very clear that that's not the way to do it. And so if you're going to fast something, and no matter what, like you can't show it and you don't need to let people know it. Don't go on social media, we're called to a fast and put black stuff under your eyes. This is brutal. <laughs> like that's not the idea of fasting. The Bible's very clear. You're going to receive your reward. That is your reward right there. It's not for show. And when you fast, notice, this was expected. It doesn't say if. As a Christian, it says when you fast. You're going to fast. He's like, that's part of being a Christian. Like, when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled. So people will admire them for their fasting. Whoa, there goes a person fasting. You know, it's like, whoa, they're really spiritual. I tell you the truth. That is the only reward they're ever going to get. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, then no one will notice that you're fasting. Except who? Your father who knows what you do in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. This is between you and God, the fast. And he rewards it. You don't go to work and people are like, oh, you okay? You want to go to lunch? No, I'm fasting. <laughs> you know, don't, don't do that. Oh, you're fasting, really? Wow. And I understand it could be a good witness. I get that, but that's, this isn't the time for it. The Bible's very clear that this isn't the time for it. Every time we sacrifice for God, we're rewarded. It may not be materially. It might be. It may not be. It may be spiritual growth. It may be more influence, more opportunity. But every time we sacrifice for him, we're blessed. He says it right here. He will reward us. Why do people put the ashes on the forehead? Well, some traditions, that's part of Ash Wednesday. They put those on their forehead. But again, if you're going out in public, ashes on your forehead, and people are going to go, Either people that know the tradition are going to go, oh, wow, wow, they're fasting, wow, or they're repenting, or wow, that's cool. That's, that, you just lost your reward. If you want to put ashes on your head, do it at home. And then when you leave, before you leave, wash it off. When you come home, put it back on. Walk around the ashes on your face, on your head, wherever you want. Just put it on. I don't care. It doesn't matter. But do it at home. Don't go out in public. There's nothing in Scripture that says go out in public with, with, your, with a thing on your head like that. Now, there were certainly times in Scripture where people were to repent in sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. And there was an uncleanliness that was tied to that oftentimes. It was, oh, they can't come to synagogue or they can't be a part of the public because they are unclean. So there was that. But when it's this context, we're sacrificing something for God, we are not to show it. 
It is between us and God. Very simple ways to start. Start simple. <laughs> Practical ways to begin. Start simple. Okay, this could be something if, you, listen, listen, this, this is the biggest thing. Listen to me very clearly. If you've never fasted anything before, do not, do not say, I'm not eating for 40 days and 40 nights like the Lord Jesus. Don't do it. Listen, you're not Jesus. Find someone around you. Tell them you're not Jesus. Just tell them, quick, let them know you're not Jesus. All right. Some of you are way too excited to tell that person around you. That's not. All right, a little bit. Don't start like that. Uh, and even if you're going to fast food, you need to talk to your doctor. <laughs> I don't know your particular health situation, but you need to say to your doctor, I'm thinking about fasting, and the doctor will help you understand what that could mean for you. Um, but what I would say is start with something simple. It might be a certain beverage. It might be a certain kind of food. It might be, as I mentioned earlier, television. It may be getting up earlier. You can go through the list of things you can fast. And it may even be, if you're just starting on this thing, it may be from sunup to sundown. You say, you know what, throughout the day, I'm not going to do this. So there's multiple ways you can do this, but start simple and build up over time. If this is your first time, it's very important. Now, secondly, believe God will bless, and we, we have already said this, believe God will bless. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to emphasize the verse that I hit a moment ago. And your Father who sees everything might reward you. Yeah, that's something I want to emphasize today, is that you're going to see a blessing come from it. He's going to reward you. Now, I'm not saying, oh, car. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying material things, you know. Some people, they always go to material. But there's something greater, of greater value than material, than a material gift, which it may be. But I'm just saying there's things that are more important than that, and that's our spiritual growth, and that's our greater influence, that's our greater opportunity that he's going to put in front of us, perhaps, because we're ready for it. We're getting ready for it. He will reward you for this sacrifice. And finally, number three, know that your light will be more evident. So we're in this series on the word of the year being light. When you sacrifice for the Lord, when you do this, your light shines out brighter and brighter and brighter. That's the whole purpose of being with the Lord and creating this space is that, remember, remember what we said last week, it's not you creating the light and you shining that light in that way. You are simply reflecting God's light more and more. You're reflecting his light. Just like Moses. Take a look at what happened to Moses. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, what was he doing? Meeting with the Lord. Carrying the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. He wasn't aware that his face had become more, what's the word? Radiant. Because he had spoken to the Lord. He had spent 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai with the Lord. He had spent that time with the Lord and he came down. His face was so radiant because he had spent time with God up close and personal that he had to veil it. It was that bright. And the people, were, people of Israel are, whoa, 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 bro. Like, you need to cover that. We they didn't have sunglasses back then. <laughs> Got to cover that up, man. We can't even look at you. It scared them. That's the idea. The more time we spend with the Lord, the more time that we create space for the Lord, the more radiant our light shines. That's what's going to happen as we do this and as we commit to this. It's such a powerful reminder. Here's the parameters. I just want to reemphasize, and then we're going to go to communion. The parameters of the fast are very simply. Begins this Wednesday after membership dinner on February 22nd. <laughs> Whatever you're fasting, don't fast food on Wednesday. <laughs> it ends Saturday, April 8th, Holy Saturday. We're going to practice it six days a week, not on Sunday. So what I want to ask you is what will you fast for the next 40 days? And we'll go, through, we'll go to prayer here and then... We'll go into communion, and that's a time where you want to examine yourself. You want to just kind of, Lord, is there something you want me 
to fast? Is there something you want me to sacrifice? What is it that you would have me do during that time? If you don't know, some of you, you knew right away. There's like 15 things. You might have just narrowed it down a little bit. That's okay. Narrow it down, something that you can do. And I say write it down and let us know, not so you can you know, lose your reward, so we can pray for you. When we talk about not shouting it from the rooftops, it doesn't mean you can't share it with your spouse or share it with your small group for accountability, not for pride, for accountability purposes. And we'd love to pray with you through that if that's something you'd like to do. First, I'm going to pray so some of you can receive Christ and you can take communion right after that. So let's go ahead and go to prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this teaching that you give us on Lent and understanding sacrifice and understanding what that really means during this incredibly powerful season that reminds us of your sacrifice for us. And some that can hear my voice right now have not given their life to you. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to just in the silence of your heart, because he can hear you, he knows your thoughts, follow me in this prayer. We call it the ABCs of salvation. It's very simple. The A is to admit you're a sinner, you've done some things wrong. B is to believe that Jesus died for you. And C is to choose to follow him for the rest of your life. If that's you, say this in the silence of your heart. Dear Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I've made mistakes. I have not lived a perfect life. And B, I believe that you died for all my sin, past, present, and future, and you rose again on the third day. And C, I'm choosing to follow you from this day forward. I don't even know what it all means. But I believe you have my best interests at heart, and you're going to lead me and guide me because you love me. If you said that, congratulations. Welcome to the family, and you are able to take communion with us in just a moment. Others of you, though, it's time to recommit your life to Christ, and you would say, I need to. I need to recommit. And say that in your heart to him. He can hear you very simply. Say, dear Jesus, today I recommit my life to you. Maybe you haven't sacrificed much in your life for him. Maybe you haven't really thought about setting aside time for him. Tell him that. And recommit to him. If you said either yes to the Lord or recommitted, just mark that on the connection card, either online or in the seat back in front of you. We'd just be so honored to pray for you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you all the praise, for it's in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Let's move into a time of communion. If you need a communion cup, please raise your hand. You would have received them on your way in, but you may um, want one. Or Some of you were hungry earlier. You may need another one. Just so you know the way these things are, these are different than the ones we've had in the past which caused some people to lose their salvation and trying to open them. (laughs) We decided we would make it easier, but you got to turn it upside down. I know, it's tough. Because it throws you off, doesn't it? And now you're going to spill it if you do that. So if you need another one, because you open the top first, raise your hand. But this is a time, really, I do want us to evaluate. I want you to take a moment, and before I even share the bread uh, and the cup, let's just go in a moment of silence to each each one of us to just ask the Lord, Lord, what is it that you want me to sacrifice during this season? And just, just wait for his voice, that still, small voice in your heart that you'll hear. Okay, let's go to prayer now. The Bible tells us that we are to take time to examine ourselves during communion, to really reflect and remember. But the first thing is to try to think about anything that is in the way of a closer relationship with God. And so that's the focus. Lord, what is it keeping me from 
closer walk with you. The requirements for communion are very simply, you must be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation. It's not Jesus and. It's not Jesus and Buddha. It's not Jesus and karma. It's not Jesus and Islam. It's not Jesus and any other religion. It is Jesus only. That's a requirement. Do not take the communion if that is not your belief. The Bible is very clear about some penalties that are involved in that. At the Last Supper, he was with his disciples and he was explaining what was going to happen. And he took some bread, and we can do that together now. He took some bread. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. Let's do that together. In the same way, he took the cup and passed it, and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And they would understand the meaning of blood, the disciples did, because of the power of the Old Testament sacrifices and the sacrificial system that was in place. And when Jesus said, this is the new covenant, he explained that he was doing this once and for all, one sacrifice for all. No longer did we need to sacrifice animals. No longer was that necessary. It was now, very simply, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his spilled blood. And he wanted the disciples to remember that. And he wants us to remember as well what he did for us and his sacrifice for us. It is a small thing for us to decide we're going to sacrifice something for him during the Lenten season. Thank you, Lord, for this. Let's take and drink. Lord, we are so grateful for your sacrifice for us and we recognize and we remember and we know, God, we we have nothing without you. And so we give you the praise and as each of us continue to process and to take that step of sacrifice for you, whatever it might be during this season, show us, help us, and as you promised, bless us. We thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Please stand as I bless you as you go. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you. And may you shine his light more and more every day. God bless you guys. You are dismissed. Love you.